Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone to our collaborative meeting. Do I change the slides or do you? <laughs> Perfect. All right. Today's agenda, we're going to do a sign in um, and then we're going to present the data um, and DHHS is going to do that. And then we're going to have a closing and evaluation. Right. Jen, um, do you have the notes? Can you pull up the notes for this one? Yeah, I can go. Not see them. Okay, yeah, you yep. just do it. Yep, it's all good. I can go over the instructions. Just a few reminders um, about the different tools that we have in Zoom. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, you'll see your toolbar with um, different functions like your mic, your video, your chat, your reactions. Um, the reactions allow you to show support by clapping or showing a heart. Um, feel free to use those throughout the meeting. Um, you can also um, suggest changes in pace or you raise your hand if you have a question. Um, and then the chat is the place where we can ask questions. Um, so if you have questions today while um, Haifa from MDHHS is presenting on the data, feel free to put those in the chat um, as she's talking. We'll make sure to keep an eye um, on the chat today. Um, and then as always, you can share your video if you're willing. Um, we love to see faces. Um, and feel free to unmute your mic if you have a comment or a question. Um, we are um, real casual here. Um, and if the um, red line is through the mic or the video, that means that you're not showing your video and you are on mute. Did you want to do housekeeping, Elise? Oh, you're muted. Elise, you're on mute. I'm super good at Zoom meetings, by the way. <laughs> this is a virtual meeting um, and we'd love to see you. So please share your camera whenever possible. Due to the delicate nature of this virtual gathering, if you aren't talking, please stay on mute. Um, if you have to move or step away, please turn off your camera and turn it back on when you are settled. And technology is sometimes wacky. If you get disconnected, go ahead and log back in and we will be here. All right, we want everybody to sign in today. So if you can please use this QR code um, using your phone's camera, click it and it will bring up a link for everyone to sign in. And we'll just give you all a chance um, to go ahead and do that now. So we'll pause for a minute. I also threw in the link to the sign in in the chat as well. So I just want to reiterate, and um, we had a question in the chat. Um, there is compensation for those who are attending as community members, but you must um, sign in and note that you are a community member um, and make sure that you're putting in the information and the questions that they prompt you. Okay, hopefully everyone has signed in. So we will go ahead and uh, we will turn it over um, to our special guest for today. So we have um, Haifa Haroon, who is an epidemiologist in uh, the maternal child health epidemiology section at MDHHS. And she is going to share the most recent maternal child health data for region eight with us today. Um, so just to kind of give you a heads up at several points um, during the presentation, we'll be taking a quick break from the data to talk about um, some things that people are doing around the region. Um, in order to address some of the health issues that we will be seeing um, in the data. And then we'll also have breaks for questions. Um, but as I said before, feel free to ask your questions in the chat at any time. And with that, I'll turn it over to Haifa. You have your own slides, right? Yep. Um, it looks like I can't share. I don't have permissions yet. Let's okay. Try again. Oh. There we go. Jen, can you confirm that you can see my first slide? Yes, it looks good. Awesome, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
Um, my name is Haifa Haroon, um, and as Jen said, I'm the infant health epidemiologist at MDHHS. Um, so I'll be walking through the most recent infant health statistics for Region A. Um, as Jen mentioned as well, um, yeah, feel free to drop in questions in the chat box, and then we can get to them um, during one of the breaks for the questions or at the end of the presentation. Um, a few things I want to know. Um, this is like quite a bit of information to get through. Um, but these slides are also already available um, on the MDHHS epidemiology webpage. Um, and then um, regarding the data that's actually included in the presentation. Um, so the presentation pulls from several different data systems, um, including birth and death certificates, hospitalization data, um, the PRAM survey, so the pregnancy risk assessment survey, um, the sudden unexpected death uh, case registry as well. Um, all of these different um, data systems and data sets have different lag times in terms of when they're considered final. Um, so as we go through the slides, um, you'll notice that some of the data is available um, through 2020. Other metrics only go through 2018. Um, with that said, all of the data that we're sharing with you today um, is the most um, currently like available data that we have on hand. Um, so just wanted to let you know um, that on the front end in case that's confusing. Um, also, as stated, um, I will be walking through birth outcomes uh, through 2020. So covering the first 10 months um, of the pandemic. Um, MDHHS is in the process of analyzing the impact of the pandemic on birth outcomes. Um, but it'll be quite some time before we can share those results externally. Um, also, just to apologize, like, I don't know why my lighting is so poor in my room right now, and I'm coming up really dark, but hopefully you don't, it's not going to matter because you can see the slides, but I just wanted to apologize for that. Um, all right, so the first set of slides we'll go over are the infant mortality, or on infant mortality, um, and we'll look at them over time. So look at trend data. Um, by maternal or race and ethnicity, so the race and ethnicity of the mother. Um, we'll look at infant mortality by maternal age, so the age of the infant's mother at the time of birth. Um, insurance, um, so how they intended to pay for the delivery. And then lastly, by residence, uh, by geography, so where the mother lived at the time of the birth. All right, so these first set of slides are on infant mortality during 2010 through 2020 in Region A. Um, infant mortality, as you know, is defined as the death of a baby before his or her first birthday um, and is expressed as a rate per 10,000 live births, per 1,000 live births, excuse me. So this slide shows um, this slide shows the infant mortality rate in Region A over the past 11 years um, as a chart. And then um, the table on the right includes the absolute numbers in the region. So you have the number of deaths, the number of live births, and then the infant mortality rate. Um, and then for comparison, um, the maroon box on the top contains the corresponding rate in Michigan in 2020, the most recent year of data that's available. Um, looking at the chart, you can see that the infant mortality rate has fluctuated a bit during this period in the region. So in 20, um, 2010, there were 79 infant deaths among residents in Region 8, um, and the infant mortality rate was 8.3 deaths per 1,000 live births. The rate and number of infant deaths decreased from 2010 to 2016, from 79 infant deaths um, in 2010 to 45 um, infant deaths in 2016. Um, in 2017, the infant death rate went back up again before declining. Um, during the past two years, the rate has stayed relatively stable. Um, in 2020, again, which is the most recent year of data that's available, there were 45 infant deaths among residents of Region 8, um, and the infant mortality rate was 5.4 deaths per 1,000 live births. Um, so, you can, if you look at the table, you can see that um, there were 45 infant deaths in both 2016 and 2020. 
um, but the infant death rate is actually slightly higher in 2020. And that's because the number of live births, um, which is the denominator to calculate the rate, the number of live births has decreased, which makes it, which increases the rate as well. So that's why um, that's the case. Okay. Um, so this slide shows the infant mortality rate in Region 8 um, by maternal race and ethnicity during 2016 to 2020. Um, the data is aggregated um, over five years so that we have um, an adequate sample size to calculate more precise rates. So um, just to orient you, um, the table includes the raw number of infant deaths. Um, so you have a column for that, a column for the number of live births, and then the number of in then the infant mortality rate by race and ethnicity. Um, and then the bar chart corresponds to those rates. Um, and then the statewide rates by race and ethnicity are all the way in the rightmost column, um, all the way on the right um, for comparison. So looking at the bar chart, um, the infant mortality rate in Region 8 is highest among infants born to Black non-Hispanic mothers um, at 10.9 um, deaths per 1,000 live births. Uh, the rate amongst this group is one point nine times or almost two times higher than the rate among infants born to white non-Hispanic mothers at 5.8 deaths per 1,000 live births. Um, during this period, uh, there were 3.5 deaths per 1,000 live births among infants born to Hispanic mothers. Um, and this is lower than the corresponding rate statewide, uh, which you can see um, in the, again in the rightmost column. Um, there were zero deaths among infants born to American Indian mothers in the region during this period, um, and there were fewer than six infant deaths born to um, Asian Pacific Islander mothers. Um, as such, so um, for that group, the absolute number and the rate is masked. Um, this might come up again in the presentation. Um, so this slide shows the infant mortality rate by maternal age group in, um, in Region 8. Um, the infant mortality rate is highest among infants with mothers less than 20 years of age at nine deaths per 1,000 live births. Um, the infant mortality rate is similar among mothers who are 20 to 29, 20 to 29 and 30 plus years of age. Um, at 6.2 and 5.9 deaths per 1,000 uh, live births, respectively. Um, and then the table on the right includes the absolute number of infant deaths, um, births, and then the infant death rate in Region 8. Um, and then it also includes the rate in Michigan overall. Just for comparison, um, the number of infant deaths during this five period is highest among um, the 20 to 29 year age group. Um, this is also the group with the highest number of live births, which is what we would expect. Um, so just wanna make sure that um, in addition to the rate, we're also looking at the absolute numbers as well. Um, compared to the statewide rates, uh, the rates in region eight are slightly lower um, with the exception of a 30 plus age group, which is on par with the corresponding statewide rate. Um, so this slide shows the infant mortality rate in Region 8 by intended payment source at birth during 2016 to 2020. Um, again, it's structured similar to the previous tables. Um, among mothers who intended to pay through Medicaid, the infant mortality rate was seven, um, seven deaths per 1,000 live births, uh, which is greater than the rate among those who intended to pay through private insurance. Um, at 5.6 deaths per 1,000 live births. Um, statewide, we see um, a slightly greater disparity between the two groups um, at 8.8 .8 and 4.8 deaths uh, um, per 1,000 live births. So, so within the region, the disparity is 1.25. It's um, 1.25 times higher within the Medicaid group and then um, Statewide, it's 1.8 times, the infant mortality rate is 1.8 times greater among the Medicaid group. So. All right, so um, this map depicts the infant mortality rate um, by census tract um, during 2015 to 2019. 
Um, just to note, the previous slides um, use data from 2016 through 2020. Um, this is because these maps were created using um, the linked birth cohort files, uh, which is a data set of um, births from that birth year linked to the death record um, for that infant within, within a year from the birth, if that makes sense. Um, so there's a longer, um, essentially there's a longer lag time for that data set um, and so the 2020 isn't yet available. Um, so a few notes about this map. Um, the data is mapped by census tract um, and you can see um, you can see the census tract boundaries in kind of like a light white outline. Um, the counties in the map are labeled um, and are separated by kind of a thicker white um, outline. And then you can look at the legend on the right. Um, any tracks with um, zero infant deaths or zero live births during this period um, for, for residents for residents of those tracks are grayed out. Um, the pink color, the lightest color in the legend, um, indicates an infant mortality rate under 6.6 .6 deaths per 1,000 live births. Um, it's used to represent areas that have an infant mortality rate that is less than the state average. Um, the color in the middle, uh, the purple color, um, indicates areas that are doing roughly similar to the state average or within one standard deviation of the average. Um, and then the darkest like maroon color um, indicates um, census tracts um, with infant mortality rates that are higher than the state average. Um, looking back at the map, there are some areas we see in Gray and Varian, um, Cass, St. Joseph, Branch, and Calhoun. Um, and then most of the map is uh, one of these two colors, like the light pink or the medium purple, um, which indicates areas that where the infant mortality rate is either less or similar to the state average. Um, and then obviously the, the darkest color indicates areas that are doing um, with infant mortality rates greater than the state average. And we see these in Berrien County, um, in Cass, a few um, in Kalamazoo, and a few in Calhoun as well. Um, something to keep in mind, um, that so because these rates are calculated at the census track level, the numbers get really small. Um, and so that can lead to like a greater than um, expected um, uh, infant mortality rate. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then I think a natural question when we look at some of this data um, is to wonder like what drives the high infant mortality rate um, in the areas that are dark purple. Um, but I think equally important are to think about is the protect, you know, the protective factors that do exist in the areas with significantly lower infant mortality rates as well. I'm sorry, this is Keena from Berrien. So um, the light gray areas, can you, I'm sorry, can you share again what that, what that shows? Yeah, so there's just not enough data there. Um, so there might be, um, there were no infant deaths. So there might have been, you know, a handful of births, but no infant deaths for residents of that census tract. And so there's no infant mortality rate that you can calculate. It would be zero or, um, or there's just like no births in that census tract during that period. Okay, and then the... So there's there we, the, um, there wouldn't wouldn't be an infant mortality rate that you could calculate. So there's either um, no infant deaths, so there might have been X number of births but no deaths, or there might have been um, no births in the first place. It's either or. Okay, and then you said with the darker. Yeah, the the dark this dark purple mm -hmm. color are are, are tracks where resident. Um, are where the infant mortality rates are higher than the state average. Okay. Um, the middle one is where it's roughly similar to the state average, and the lighter, the pink color indicates areas um, with it where the infant mortality rate is less than the state average. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'll throw it over to Elise. Yep, so I'm actually going to fill in um, for Elise. Um, let me share my screen again. Okay. 
Okay. So um, we, uh, first of all, thank you, Haifa, for sharing um, that information. Um, and we know that, you know, when we're thinking about infant mortality um, and, you know, the babies that are dying in region eight, that this, you know, can get really heavy. And sometimes that heavy feeling can actually feel like helplessness. Um, and so we wanted to take a brief pause from the data and talk about all of the um, really great things that are going on around the region in order to address infant mortality. Because um, although the, we know that there's still more work to be done, um, we all and you all um, really are making a difference. Um, and so over the next few minutes, we'll talk, be talking about a few of the initiatives in the region. Um, but disclaimer, it does by no means cover all the work that's being done. Um, so at the end of each of these mini breaks, we're also going to leave some time for all of you um, to put things in the chat and share where your organization or organizations or groups that you know of are doing. Um, and then at the end of the meeting, we'll compile all of, all of that information and send it out to all of you. So it's also an opportunity to learn about maybe some other programs in the region um, that you might not know about yet. Um, so the first one um, that we want to talk about is um, Cradle Kalamazoo. Um, so um, Cradle, um, Cradle's goal is to reduce Kalamazoo's overall infant mortality rate to uh, 3.0 per 1,000 live births um, and to eliminate racial disparities in infant mortality by 2030. Um, so they accomplish their work by helping families connect with a community health worker, referring families to social and medical resources, um, and enrolling pregnant and parenting families into home visiting programs. Um, they also hold community baby showers and community health events focused on health equity. Um, and um, we're very excited because in October, we'll be hosting a vaccination campaign and community event with them um, in which there's going to be dinner served and a vaccination panel um, available for Q&A, um, as well as vaccinations given during the event. Um, Childcare is going to be provided also, so um, parents can come and get their questions answered. Um, so you can be on the lookout for more information about that event soon. Next, we have the um, FEMER team or fetal infant mortality review team. Um, so FEMER teams are made up of local health providers, consumers, infant health advocates and leaders. Um, and the team reviews infant deaths and analyzes factors that may have contributed to the death, um, including significant social, economic, cultural, safety, health and systems factors. Um, so not only do they identify these types of factors, but then they use that information to go on to design and implement community-based action plans to work toward preventing future infant mortality. Um, so in Region 8, um, we think there are three main FEMER teams, um, and these are all um, orchestrated or connected to MDHHS. Um, most of the FEMER teams are housed at local health departments. Um, the easiest way to get in touch with um, a specific FEMER team for a specific area of the region um, is you can reach out to um, Audra Brummel at the state. And then lastly, we wanted to talk about um, home visiting programs. Um, so um, we know that we have a pretty diverse audience today and not everyone is familiar with home visiting. So we wanted to take a minute to um, explain how truly wonderful they are and also the, how impactful they can be. Um, so home visiting programs listen and offer support for the whole family. Um, they can help find community resources for food, housing, healthcare, and more. Um, they can screen the child and check developmental progress. They can give free health screenings through some of the programs, um, and they can also connect parents with parent groups or play groups. Um, and um, when thinking about, you know, why home visiting programs are important, um, the nurses, social workers, and educators in the home visiting programs can really be a trusted resource to give parents the tools and information they need um, to keep their child healthy, safe, and ready for success later in life. So there are eight types of home visiting programs that are operating in Region 8. 
Um, and just because someone is enrolled in one doesn't necessarily disclude them from participating in a different one. Um, each program really has different eligibility criteria um, and small differences in the focus. So all of these programs are available to pregnant people and um, can follow that birth person and infant at least through their first birthday and some programs up to the age of five. Um, so the great thing about home visiting is that the programs are focused on the whole family um, and parents with resources, support, and learning how to connect with and care for the baby. Um, so uh, we are not um, home visiting experts ourselves, um, so we're not going to dive specifically into each of the programs, um, but we do have a, a very long list that we've been compiling of home visiting programs in the region, um, and that's divided by county. Um, and so we'll be sending that out um, with the uh, notes after the meeting. And Bonita, thank you for mentioning early on as well. Um, don't forget about early on as a, another model of home visiting. Um, because there's um, so many small differences in eligibility and focus, the easiest way um, for a community member to find and get enrolled in a home visiting program is to call their local health department um, or visit the websites that we have on the slide or the website, yeah, websites that we have on the slide. Um, both of those are very informative um, and can help get you connected. Oh, and I see some love for NFP. That's great. Um, all right, and so um, we, as I mentioned, want to know what resources you know of in the region that are specifically addressing infant mortality. So please go ahead and um, put some more shout outs in the chat um, for other programs that you know of um, to kind of share that information with uh, all of the collaborative members. Um, and also if you prefer to share later on, or if you think of something later on, um, feel free um, to just uh, reach out to Elise because she is the one who's been doing all of this great work compiling information about different home visiting programs in the region. Oh yes, and my aim, Michigan Alliance for Infant Maternal Health, Mental Health, right? Yes. Oh, yes, Dorothy, proud to be an NFP nurse. I see a lot of love for home visiting in the room. That's awesome. All right. And so with that, I'll go ahead and I'm going to turn it back over to Haifa to do the next section of the data presentation. Sounds good. Um, all right, I'm assuming you can see the first slide, the low birth weight slide. Yep, looks great. Awesome, thanks. Um, so the next set of slides will follow um, a similar format as before, um, and we'll cover how we'll cover low birth weight births in Region Eight. Um, so these are live births who weighed less than twenty five hundred grams, or less than five and a half pounds at birth. There we go. Um, so this slide shows the percent of live births that were low birth weight in the region over the past 11 years. Um, the percent of low birth weight births um, has slightly increased during this period. So in 2010, 7.7% um, of live births were born with a low birth weight, um, and then it stayed steady for a few years, as you can see. Um, the proportion of low birth weight births declined slightly through 2016 um, to a low of 7.3%, 7, 7 excuse me. In 2017, the proportion of low birth weight births increased again um, to a high of 8.4% um, and decreased in 2018 before going back up again, so small fluctuations. Um, in 2020, um, the most recent year of data that's currently available, 8.1% um, of births in Region 8 had a low birth weight. This is lower than the corresponding rate statewide um, that same year, uh, which is 9%. Um, so like note again that the proportion, um, so although the proportion of uh, low birth weight births has slightly increased since 2010, so going from 7.1% to 8.1%, 7.7 .7 to 8.1%, the absolute number of low birth weight um, births um, annually has decreased. So there were 735 um, low birth weight births in 2010, and then um, in the region, in Region 8, 
and then in 2020 there were 674. Um, so the overall number of live births has decreased by quite a bit, so hence again um, the rate increasing. Um, so this slide shows the percent of low birth weight births in the region uh, by maternal race and ethnicity um, during 2016 and 2020. Um, the table is structured similar to the infant mortality table, uh, but in this case, the columns represent um, number of low birth weight births, um, number of live births, um, and then the proportion of uh, low birth weight births. Um, and then again, the bar chart corresponds to these percentages. And then all the way on the right is, are the numbers for Michigan uh, for comparison. Um, so we see that the low birth weight rate uh, was highest among infants with Black non-Hispanic mothers uh, with 14.1% of the live births weighing less than five and a half pounds at birth. Um, the rate of low birth weight births is two times higher among births to Black non-Hispanic mothers compared to their white counterparts. Um, at 6.9%. 8.4% um, of births to American Indian mothers um, were low birth weight during this period. Um, and this is on par with the corresponding rate statewide. Um, an equal proportion of white, non-Hispanic, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islander births um, were low birth weight in Region 8. Um, all about 7%. Um, the proportion of low birth weight birth infants um, with Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islander uh, moms is lower in Region 8 um, compared to the corresponding rate statewide. Um, it's similar, it's relatively similar um, for um, among infants with white non-Hispanic mothers. So this slide shows the proportion of low birth weight births by maternal age group in region eight. Um, as you can see, there's like a slight um, U-shaped pattern. Um, the proportion of um, low birth weight births is highest among the youngest age group at 9.5%. Um, so among the under 20 year age group. Um, this is lower than the corresponding rate statewide, which you can see in the table. Um, at 11%. Um, this is followed by the 30 plus age group at 8.2%. Um, and then on the lower end, 7.6% of live births to mothers 20 to 29 years of age were born with a low birth weight. Um, this is also lower um, than the corresponding rate statewide, which is 8.6%. So this slide shows the proportion of low birth weight births in Region 8 by intended payment source at birth um, during 2016 to 2020 um, within Region 8. Um, among mothers um, intending to use Medicaid, 9.1% um, were low birth weight, um, and this is lower than the corresponding rate statewide at almost 11%. Um, on the lower end, 7% um, of live births uh, where the mother was intending to use private insurance uh, were low birth weight, and this is in line with what we see statewide. So this map depicts uh, low birth weight by census tract during 2015 or 2019, um, and it can be read similarly to the previous map that we looked at. Um, again, you can see that the counties are labeled. Um, most of the region is in the the lightest color in this light purple. Um, and so these are areas where, uh, these are census tracts that have a lower proportion of low birth weight births um, compared to the state average. So they're the, the lightest color, these are areas that are doing better than the state average. Um, there are several pockets that are this medium purple color. Um, and these are areas that are doing um, similar to the state average. Um, and you can see they're in every county as well. And then the dark, the darkest color in the legend, this dark blue represents areas um, where the proportion of low birth weight births is greater than the state average. Um, and we can see these, um, a few of these tracks um, in Berrien County, in Kalamazoo, as well as Calhoun County. All right, so um, 
the next set of slides um, will again follow a similar format and will cover um, preterm birth in Region 8. Um, as a reminder, preterm birth is defined as a live birth delivered at less than 37 completed, um, completed weeks gestation. So this slide shows the percent of live births that were preterm over the past decade or so in the region. Um, overall, uh, the preterm birth rate on average seems to have slightly increased um, on average during this period. Um, in 2010, probably on the left, 9.1% um, of births in the region were preterm, um, and this comes to 869 uh, preterm births that year in the region. The rate declined um, between 2012 to 2016 below um, falling below 9% um, and hitting a low of 8.5% in 2015. In 2017, the proportion of preterm births increased again um, and hit a high of 9.8% in 2019. Um, and then 2020, um, the most recent year of data that we have available, um, 9.3%, a little over 9% of the births um, in the region were preterm. And this is lower than the preterm birth rate um, statewide, which is a little over 10% on the right hand. So this slide shows the proportion of preterm births in Region 8 by the mother's race or ethnicity um, during 2016 to 2020. Um, again, the statewide rates um, are in the rightmost column for comparison. Uh, the prevalence of preterm birth, um, births is highest among um, births to Black non-Hispanic mothers at 13.3%. Um, this is lower than the corresponding rate statewide um, at almost 15%. 8.7% um, of births to white non-Hispanic mothers were preterm, um, and that's roughly on par uh, with the corresponding rate statewide. Um, and that's followed by births to uh, Hispanic mothers. So 8.2% uh, of these um, infants, of these live births were preterm. 6.3% um, of births among American Indian mothers were preterm. Um, and then 5.6% um, of births to Asian Pacific Islander mothers were preterm. Um, the preterm birth rates for these three groups, so for Hispanic, American Indian, and Asian Pacific Islander, um, they're all lower than what we see um, than their corresponding rates statewide, which you can see in the right column. Um, so this slide shows the proportion of preterm births by maternal age in Region 8. Um, again, we see a slight um, U-shape, uh, but in the opposite direction, actually. Um, so here we see that the proportion of preterm births is highest among the 30-plus age group um, at slightly more than 10%, um, and that's followed by the under-20 um, age group, um, so by 9.5% of preterm births among infants with mothers under 20 years of age. Um, and then on the lower end, 8.5% um, of live births to 20 to 29, um, to mothers who are 20 to 29 years old were preterm. And then statewide, again, in the table, we see um, a similar pattern. Uh, so this slide shows the proportion of preterm births in Region 8 uh, by intended payment source at birth during 2016 to 2020. 10% um, of births to mothers intending to use Medicaid were preterm, um, compared to 8.7% of mothers intending to use private insurance. Um, statewide, 11.5% um, of mothers um, intending to use Medicaid were preterm, so that's greater um, than the corresponding rate in the region. Um, and then again, 9.3% um, of births to mothers intending to use private insurance statewide um, were preterm, and that's sort of, that's pretty close to slightly greater than what we see in the region. 
All right, so this map depicts um, pre uh, percent preterm by census tract during 2015 to 2019 in Region 8. Again, it can be read um, similar to the other maps. Um, there again are large sections of the map um, that are the light green, the lightest color in the map. Um, and these are tracks that are doing better than um, better than the state average in terms of their preterm birth rate. So it's lower. Um, the light green color, the one in the middle, these are tracks that are doing um, similar to the state average. Um, and then again, the darkest green color in the legend, um, these are areas that are doing worse than the state average or greater than the state average. Um, and we only see a few tracks here um, in Kalamazoo County um, and Calhoun County. Um, and we can pause here for any questions and I can also check the chat to see if there's any as well. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. I was wondering if it would be possible those census tracts that are invariant, if we could know specifically which census tracts they were. Um, I believe as part of, um, so I think this is maybe the, I don't remember how often, um, Chris and his team, we've we've presented these slides, but I believe as part of um, the agreement of providing data at this granular level, because the numbers do get really small, I believe we agreed to not disclose the actual census tracts. Um, but I could check with Chris to confirm. Um, so you're you would want to know the the, um, the track number for those uh, that are in that have a higher, have an infant mortality rate that's greater than the state average, Dorothy, is that, did I get that yes. correct? Yes, it, that's correct. Is that just for infant mortality rate or would it be for all three metrics? For all three metrics. Okay, um, I definitely know we were, part of the agreement was to not disclose the actual percentage, okay. um, but the track number might actually be fine. So I'll um, run that by Chris and we can provide that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just want to ask, are these slides going to be available or is it just um, that it has to be on the, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services um, website? Um, I can share them out with um, Emily or Jen um, okay. to, to like email them out, but they can also be downloaded from the website as well. Okay. Any other questions at this point? Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, I'll, I'll go ahead and then um, I think we have another break for questions as well. Okay. All right, so the next set of slides, um, Um, the next set of slides focus on um, tobacco use during pregnancy, um, breastfeeding, um, prenatal care, and NAS. Um, let's see. Here we go. Um, so this slide shows the percentage of live births um, during 2016 to 2020, where the mother reported smoking um, during the most recent pregnancy. Um, in this case, smoking refers to the use of tobacco products overall. Um, so in this chart, um, the dark blue bars represent region eight, um, and then um, probably starting from the left, um, those are region eight, and then anything in gray represents um, Michigan data for comparison. Um, so starting off on all the way on the left, um, smoking was more frequently reported in the region um, than the state. So smoking during pregnancy was reported for more than 19%, so roughly um, a fifth of live births in the region, um, and reported for among almost 15% of live births statewide. Um, in comparison to the state, 
uh, the proportion of smoking among births to white non-Hispanic and um, black non-Hispanic mothers is greater in the region than compared to the state. So comparing, and this is true for white non-Hispanic and black non-Hispanic groups, um, it's higher in the region than the state. Um, reported smoking is slightly lower um, among births to Hispanic and American Indian mothers in the region when compared to the state. Um, they're pretty close though. Um, and then finally, um, smoking was reported by a similar proportion in the region and the state among births um, to Asian Pacific Islander mothers. Um, and then just looking at um, just region eight, just looking at um, only the blue bars, um, on the high end, uh, tobacco use during pregnancy was reported um, for almost 36%, so more than a third of live births um, to American Indian mothers during this time. Uh, the prevalence of smoking during pregnancy was similar among live births to white non-Hispanic and black non-Hispanic mothers, um, both accounting for about a fifth of live births. Um, Smoking during pregnancy was reported among more than 9% of live births to Hispanic mothers. Um, and then on the low end, it was reported among 1.6% um, of live births to Asian Pacific Islander mothers. Um, there are a few caveats to note about um, this data. Um, so reported, reported smoking is likely an underreported measure on the birth certificate, um, which is where this data is from. Um, and then also this, this data doesn't capture um, the frequency of use of tobacco products. So for instance, if it was um, a one-time use for ceremonial purposes, for example, um, or the trimester in which it was used. So just wanna keep those um, caveats in mind. All right, so moving on to breastfeeding initiation and duration um, and this data is specific to Michigan. Um, over 2010 to um, during 2010 to 2020. Um, so this, this statewide breastfeeding data um, is from CRAMS or the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System um, um, from, and my apologies, it's from 2004 to 2020. Um, so just to orient you, um, there are four lines on this slide. Uh, the top one in um, dark blue, um, represents the weighted proportion of mothers who breastfed at any point during their most recent pregnancy. So breastfed at any point during their pregnancy. Uh, the second line, the one in gray, uh, represents reported breastfeeding for a month. Um, the third line in light blue um, represents mothers, the proportion of mothers who reported breastfeeding for two months. Um, and then the last line, represents uh, the proportion of mothers who reported breastfeeding for three months. So at any point, one month, two months, three months. Um, so breastfeeding initiation and duration proportions, um, you can see were largely static um, during this period from 2004 to 2009. The years from 2009 through 2015 um, is when we saw an um, in increase in reported breastfeeding at all four time points. So um, breastfeeding at any point of the pregnancy went from 76% to 85%. Um, the increase in breastfeeding for three months increased from 43% to 55% or 55.5%. Um, and then from 2015 to the present, you can see that we've um, plateaued again. So um, the ever, having ever, uh, the proportion of mothers who reported ever breastfeeding um, went from 85 to 85.9, um, reported breastfeeding for three months at least, um, went from 55.5% to 58.4. So not as much change as we saw during this middle period. All right, so moving on to um, late prenatal, late entry in a prenatal care uh, for Prosperity Region 8. Um, so this slide shows the proportion of live births uh, where prenatal care was initiated late by maternal race and ethnicity. Um, so here, late prenatal care um, is defined as initiating prenatal care 
during the last three months of gestation. So in months um, seven, eight, or nine um, of the pregnancy. Again, um, the region eight data is in uh, the blue bars um, and the statewide data is in gray. Overall, um, so looking at these bars all the way on the left, um, late prenatal care was more commonly reported in region eight um, than statewide. Um, during 2016 to 2020, late prenatal care was reported for 6.5, 6.5% of live births in the region uh, compared to 4.1% statewide. Um, consistently across the subgroups as well, you can see that late prenatal care was more often reported um, in the region than the state. Um, and then looking at just um, the region A data, so looking at just the blue bars, um, on the higher end, late prenatal care was reported among 8.4% of live births to American Indian mothers. Um, and that's followed by similar proportional live births to Hispanic and Black non-Hispanic mothers. They're both around 7.7, 7.8%. And on the lower end, we have um, prenatal care was initiated late among a similar proportion of live births to white non-Hispanic um, and Asian Pacific Islander mothers around 6 to 6.1%. All right, so um, the next few slides are focused on um, neonatal abstinence syndrome or NAS. Um, so a little background about the data. Um, NAS cases um, are identified using diagnosis codes in the Michigan inpatient database. So the date this NAS data comes from hospitalization records. Um, and in the fall of 2015, uh, there was a transition from um, the way um, the way things were coded in hospitalization records. So they, there was a shift from ICD-9 to ICD-10. Um, and so that may have contributed um, to some fluctuation that we see in the trend data. Um, additionally, NAS also may be undercounted or underreported um, with the increasing use of non-pharmacological interventions, um, which means, so they, they're not necessarily consistently captured in the data. And so I just wanna keep those things in mind um, when we're looking at the data. All right, so this slide shows a trend in neonatal abstinence syndrome, or NAS, um, in Region 8 over the past 11 years. Um, so as you may know, NAS is a treatable condition that newborns may experience um, as a result of prenatal exposure to certain substances um, with symptoms including severe irritability, difficulty feeding, and seizures. Um, the number and rate of cases in Region 8 um, increased from 2010 to 2013, um, peaking at 71 cases um, in 2013, and then again, um, increasing again from 2014 to 2015. Um, overall, in the past overall in the past five years, uh, the number and rate of cases has um, decreased. Um, 2017 seems to be kind of like the outlier um, to be the exception here. Um, over the past two years from 2019 to 2020, um, the rate has stayed consistent, relatively consistent. Um, in 2020, um, the NAS incidence rate, incidence rate um, in Region 8 was almost 400 cases per 100,000 live births um, with 33 annual cases. Um, so this slide depicts the rate of NAS or neonatal abstinence syndrome by maternal race or ethnicity in Region, um, in region 8 um, over this five-year period. Um, the data, again, is aggregated over five years um, and then the statewide rate is in the rightmost column. Um, so the absolute number of cases and rate is highest. Um, oh wait, so like, again, this table is set up similar to the other tables that we've seen. And in this case, it's um, number of cases. Um, so you have the number of NAS cases, the number of live births, and then you have the NAS rate, and then the bar chart corresponds to that rate. 
and then Michigan is all the way on the right. Um, so the absolute number of um, highest number of cases um, and highest rate um, is highest among births to white non-Hispanic mothers at uh, 194 cases over the past five years, um, or a rate of 611 cases per 100,000 live births. Um, this rate in Region 8 for this group is lower than the corresponding rate statewide. Um, um, this is followed by um, 23 cases among infants to Black non-Hispanic mothers at a rate of 370 cases per 100,000 live births. Um, and then there were nine cases among infants to Hispanic mothers during this time um, at a rate of about 241 cases per 100,000 live births. Um, and then there were zero cases among um, American Indian um, infants to American Indian and um, Asian Pacific Islander uh, mothers during this time. Um, and so the rate would be um, a zero in that case. And I'll turn it off to you again. Hi, Phil. Before we turn it over to Christina, there was a question in the chat. Um, the question is um, whether inductions and elective cesareans are included in the data. It may have been in reference to preterm. Yes. So, um, okay. so if those were live births, um, so the data isn't disaggregated by the type of delivery. Uh, whether it's a natural birth or if there's a cesarean. Um, oh, for like the preterm preterm portion of it, um, yes, it's not um, disaggregated by whether or not it was induced or if it was, I don't know if, if whether or not it's elective is a field in the birth certificate that we have access to. Um, so it's not broken down by that, so yes. Um, it does include that in the data. Okay, thank you. Okay, and with that, we'll turn it over to Christina for another little mini break to talk about efforts in Region 8. And I'll bring up uh, my slides for you, Christina. Thank you. Okay, so again, another little pause so we can highlight programs in Region 8 um, that we are working to help support a healthy pregnancy, birth, and postpartum period. We also, again, encourage you to share, this is obviously not exhaustive, so share any of the things that you know about that we don't know about, please put them in the chat or you can email Elena as well. Let's start with what Swim Pick is doing. So in 2018, data showed higher rates of late entry into prenatal care um, in comparison to the rest of the state, so in our, in our region here. So we partnered with InnerCare to start off with. We tracked incoming calls of pregnant women seeking first prenatal care appointments. Um, we had originally created church fans. We sent out mailers to homes in Region 8 um, with this Go As Soon As You Know campaign that um, Swim Pick was driving. We were encouraging pregnant persons to seek that prenatal care within that first three months. Um, Calls to inner care increased during the test period, but it was hard to determine if that mailer and the church fans were the cause. Okay, the Great Start Collaborative, um, this is in Cass County. So the Cass County Great Start Collaborative is promoting early prenatal care. They are giving away these welcome baby diaper bags to pregnant people who attend a prenatal visit. Um, people are given a coupon to the left there where they have a positive pregnancy test at one of the several health centers in the area. And when they turn that coupon in at one of the clinics listed on the coupon, um, they receive the diaper bag filled with all of the supplies that you see there in the picture on the right. We have to talk, it's important about mental health care. One of the things that Michigan offers is the MC3 program. Um, it offers psychiatry to support to primary care providers, to OBGYNs um, who are managing patients with behavioral health problems. So this can include children, adolescents, young adults through age 26, and um, women who are either contemplating pregnancy or are pregnant or postpartum up to that first year. Um, psychiatrists are available on same day phone consultations. They can offer guidance on diagnostic questions, on medication recommendations, and um, appropriate psychotherapy. 
They also offer additional services that you can see in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, um, such as patient evaluations and trainings. Also, Postpartum Support International, the Michigan chapter, the website is up there for you, but this is also an all-encompassing resource for Michigan maternal health care. Um, so this is not only for professionals, but this can also be for women or birthing persons or families. There is information, um, a a provider list that you can go on and look for for psychiatry support, for therapist support. Um, there is also a line through PSI, um, same as MC3, where you can consult with a psychiatrist if you need um, medication recommendations or you need to work with someone um, with a um, issue pregnant or postpartum. There is local peer support groups that are offered through Postpartum Support International um, that are listed on the Michigan chapter, um, including Region 8. And we also just partnered with Health Resources, PSI in general, and Services Administration to develop the Maternal Mental Health Hotline. So this is available 24-7 in English and in Spanish, and that is the number, the 833-9-HELP for moms. WIC, this is one of um, one that I'm sure everyone is familiar with, but this is a federally funded program serving low and moderate income pregnant breastfeeding and postpartum people and their children up to the under the age of five. So the program provides nutritional support from education to breastfeeding peer counselors, um, as well as referrals to healthcare. People can receive WIC and SNAP EBT at the same time if they qualify for both. And the image on the left shows you some of the features in the WIC app which anyone can, um, can get and download. It is free to download. All WIC offices should have the peer support. Um, there's some other county breastfeeding coalitions, um, the Michigan Breastfeeding Network, Swimpick Social Media is available. We love to um, share support in groups that we hear of. Um, and then of course, private individuals that you know we, we partner with and believe in as well. All of that information is on there too. Um, and again, we encourage you to continue to put more information in the chat if there's others that you do know about that we should be sharing. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Yep. And while put while people are putting other things in the chat, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Haifa for the next section of the data. Awesome. Thanks, John. Um, great. Um, so the uh, these last set of slides contain data on maternal morbidity and uh, maternal mortality for Region Eight um, and the state of Michigan. Here we go. Um, all right, so uh, this slide shows the um, show severe maternal morbidity or SMM uh, data per 10,000 delivery hospitalizations um, broken down by race. Um, so the region eight data um, is on the left-hand side and that you have um, a bar chart um, and it includes data for the total population. So overall in region eight and then data broken down by race and ethnicity. And on the right, you have uh, data specific to Michigan um, um, it's not visualized, but you have the data for total population and then by race and ethnicity as well. Um, severe maternal morbidity includes unexpected outcomes of labor and delivery that result in significant short or long-term health consequences. Um, there are a set of um, 21 indicators to meet the case criteria um, of severe maternal morbidity. Um, and they include things like blood transfusion, eclampsia, um, acute heart failure, um, complications with anesthesia, for instance. Um, overall, um, the severe maternal morbidity rate in Region 8 um, is about 260 cases. Um, there are 260 cases for every um, 10,000 delivery hospitalizations. Um, and this is higher so the rate is higher in Region 8 than it is um, statewide. Um, with statewide, um, there are about 211 um, cases of severe maternal morbidity for every 10,000 delivery hospitalizations. Um, the severe maternal morbidity rate in Region 8, excluding transfusions, um, so that's represented by the gray bars as well as the gray text on the right-hand side, um, so the severe maternal morbidity rate excluding transfusions in Region 8 um, is about 
it's almost 80 cases um, per 10,000 delivery hospitalizations. Um, and that's slightly lower than the corresponding rate statewide, uh, which is 89, um, 89 per 10,000 delivery hospitalizations. So the purpose of sharing um, the severe maternal morbidity rate, excluding transfusions, um, is to show the resulting rate of severe maternal morbidity due to other severe um, maternal morbidity categories that tend to, so that, that tend to be more um, severe than um, blood transfusions because blood transfusions account for are the largest qualifier. Um, of severe maternal morbidity. So they account for the greatest number of cases. And so um, by, look, by excluding them in this category in the, in the gray, uh, represented in the um, gray bar charts, we can look at specifically more severe um, cases of maternal morbidity and compare them. Um, within the region, um, so white non-Hispanic mothers experienced a slightly lower um, severe maternal morbidity rate compared to the overall rate in the region. Uh, black non-Hispanic mothers uh, experienced a higher severe maternal morbidity rate overall, um, as well as a higher rate when transfusions were excluded um, in comparison to the total population in the region or the other um, overall in the region, and as well as greater than um, than their white counterparts. Um, Hispanic mothers experienced a higher severe maternal morbidity rate um, in compared to the region overall, um, as well as their white counterparts, but a lower rate um, when transfusions were excluded. Um, so the next slide contains um, maternal mortality data for Prosperity Region 8 in the state of Michigan. Um, so this slide shows the maternal mortality uh, ratio in Prosperity Region 8. Um, so Region 8 has a star above it, um, and then you have all the other um, regions represented as well. And then Michigan, the data for Michigan overall um, is represented by the orange bar chart um, and the orange text above. So maternal mortality is classified as a death that occurs during pregnancy or within one year of pregnancy. Um, maternal mortality can be looked at in a few different ways. Um, so specifically, this chart represents total um, maternal mortality deaths. So it includes um, maternal deaths that were related to the pregnancy. It includes maternal deaths that were unrelated to the pregnancy, as well as maternal deaths. We're unsure about whether it's related to the pregnancy or not. Um, so during this five-year period, um, so from um, 2014 to 2018, there were 34 um, maternal mortality, uh, maternal deaths in Region 8. Um, Prosperity Region 8, um, looking at the bar chart, Prosperity Region 8 experienced a maternal mortality ratio on par um, with that of Michigan during this time. Um, so in the region, the maternal mortality ratio was 74.3 deaths uh, per 100,000 live births um, compared to 72 deaths per 100,000 live births statewide. Oh, that's actually our last slide. Um, any questions? So hello, this is Kina. I don't know per se if I just have any questions or more just just a comment when you think about just just to me just looking at the the data, um, especially with the last slide when you talk about unexpected um, the unexpected outcomes and just seeing just the stark difference um, in the in the data, it's. I don't know, just with doing the work that I'm already doing, just spearheading the coalition and just with just the collaborations that we we have. And there's so many services that's that's out there when you talk about WIC, when you look at our home visiting programs. To me, on this end, what I'm seeing that 
more things need to happen more upstream to address what's actually happening. And I, I know that, you know, we're boots on the ground, we're doing a lot of work. And just to me, to look at those, to look at the numbers, um, yeah, I, I don't know, just, I'm kind of speechless really, because it's it's not that work, that we're not doing work, the work that needs to be happening as as it relates to like education and providing those, the, that undergirding that's needed for the families. To me now, I'm just, and I, and I have been thinking this, like what needs to happen more upstream? How do we call certain things out that need to be just really called out? And a lot of times that um, I just feel like we kind of tiptoe around certain things um, and just addressing like systemic racism. I mean, to me, each slide that um, each presenter went through and just broke down just, just the stats with that. I mean, you it's it's right there. We we have all this data to show. Um, yeah, now what do we do about it? And 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 I'm not just putting that on this on because everyone is doing work. It's just like I don't know that that's just a, me venting or just or what. But yeah. So okay, thank you. No, thank you. I have nothing to add. I just want um, in complete agreement with what you've said. Um, I've also worked at the local level and it this definitely doesn't, it's really depressing to annually do this presentation um, because I, I agree, I don't think it reflects the hard work and the resources um, and all the work that's, the incredible work that's being done at the like local levels. Um, and I agree that it probably, um, there probably needs to be more work done upstream. Yeah, and then I just do wanna add, so when you talk about like unexpected outcomes, it just immediately made me think about like, so then that has to, to um, the response to what's happening, right? Um, was the, did I make the remark about unexpected no, outcomes? No, I was just, I was just thinking about when you talk about like those different factors that, the things that factor into when you, all the different things that can happen that, would be like an unexpected outcome, right? Um, just how are those things being addressed? Why are we even having those? Was that in relation to maternal mortality? Yes. Or? Yes, in relation to maternal. Oh, um, oh, was it about? Um, so there are maternal deaths, so we're not sure whether or not it's related to the pregnancy. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I know there's like. Um, yeah, so the maternal mortality data, yeah, includes those that are related, unrelated, and then if we're unsure. Um, I'm less familiar with like the investigation, that process of discerning, um, like that process that goes in, goes into like investigating those maternal deaths. Um, so I can't really speak on that. Right, but even without you being able to speak on that, but just looking at those numbers and the population that is highly affected with that without you even being able to provide that content, the 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 data is. I mean, you you continue to see the same trend, the same trend throughout all the data. Yeah. Hi, this is Janine, and I am with uh, the Wish Program. Women in Support of Health at the YWCA Kalamazoo. And I um, share your thoughts, Hina, in that seeing the data is just kind of heartbreaking. You know, I, I see how hard my team works on the front line. And in fact, I was going over data with them this morning um, and just showing, we also do um, quality data um, surveys with our team. And so I was going over that, what, what the clients are saying about the work that we are doing. And it was just wonderful, just wonderful, wonderful. And so I'm, I'm just thinking here we are working so hard and producing this great work, yet seeing statistics like this, it's, it's, it just, it feels, I won't say hopeless. It's not hopeless. It's just like the battle is so great um, for for making changes for 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 turning the tides with this data, 
Um, and not sure, I'm, I'm not sure really how to do that, um, but to continue doing the work that we are doing um, and thinking that change needs to take place at more than just at the front line. Systems need to change and just not, not sure how to, to crack into that to make those changes happen. Just continuing to do the work that we're doing on the front line. And so, yeah, it's just a comment. I don't have a question and don't expect uh, you to have the answers for that. Thank you. It's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's good not to just feel like just I'm not the only one that and I'm sure that that shares that same sentiment and you know I try to work from a perspective of having like the both and in mind but to me it just feels like um because boots on the ground just work work is happening I the programs that, in which that I work in um especially the our, our Maya program our um, case loads are full. Clients are 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 um, keeping appointments. Um, we are seeing high school graduation rates um, increase. All those things we're seeing more moms that's breastfeeding. All those things that play into um, supporting moms and just making sure that um, you you get those healthy outcomes. But it keeps for me, it keeps going. You know. Um, more of that system level. And so I, I'm just thinking, do, do we have opportunity to present information or pre present data to, you know, more of, a, if it's our hospitals, just more of just, I'm just thinking just like more, um, just trying to try to see how we can do, take more of a systems approach to address, address what's happening because Again, on the from the programmatic standpoint, all those supports that's needed for families. The slide went up with all the different resources. You got WIC, you got Great Start Collaborative. You know, you got so many agencies that's doing great work and impactful work. And so that alone is not enough. And so it is it's really hard for me because. <clears throat> I work across several different programs, and one of the things that I, I really try to um, take take pride in is to ensure that the team that I directly um, supervise that we are engaging clients in a way that diversity, equity, inclusion um, is always at the forefront of the work that we're doing. That we're we're trying to educate and provide the best services and support to our family. So again, just to see this, it, it is, it is, um, it's really hard. It is really hard. I think what I'm hearing and what you're saying, Kina, and what you're saying, Janine, it makes me think of that analogy of the babies in the river, right? How it's like, we have, we see these babies that are coming down the river and it's like, oh my gosh, there's a baby in the river. And so we're like saving all the babies out of the river and putting so many resources into doing that and doing an absolutely wonderful and amazing job for those individual like babies in the example, but really families and the work that you're doing. But you at the same time have to be asking that question about like, where are these babies coming from and why are they in the river in the first place? Just like you were saying, Keena, about going upstream, right? And sort of looking at what, what are those more upstream, what are those root causes that are leading to these problems happening in the first place? And that you have to have both of those things at the same time, right? Like you're saying both and, like you have to be supporting the families in the same way that you're, you're supporting them now and helping people at that sort of individual or family unit level. But at the same time, um, as a collective, it's important to be thinking about, you know, what are what are those root causes that are leading to these outcomes that we're helping people navigate and what can we do at more of a systems level in order to address those. I agree. I think looking at root causes but, and, and looking at systems that perpetuate um, the, the negative stereotyping of, of people of color, that perpetuate um, the stereotypes 
all of the, you know, the, the negative connotations that go with Black women having babies, um, that, that just perpetuates that, that increases or keeps that gap um, between Blacks and white women who are, are bearing children and having healthy outcomes at the white level, unhealthy outcomes at the black level, just increasing that gap in there, systems need to change. While, uh, and, and again, it's that and, um, systems need to change as education is being given. And, and that's so, so much easier said than done. Thanks for bringing that um, topic up, Kina, into the group. I think that was a really important observation um, and I think a really important discussion to have around the data. Because yeah, because it's, it is, it's difficult to sit here and see slide after slide after slide that has the same racial disparities across all of these different indicators and outcomes. So it's, it's important to talk about, you know, what is it that we're doing and what more can we do? And I don't want to dominate conversations and Jennifer, because you've worked so much with me, you know, this is kind of something that is, you know, is the work is, is definitely near and dear to, to, to my heart. But um, I'll just, I'll just say this to when you look at our institutions, whether that's our healthcare institution, whether that's our, we're talking about our judicial uh, systems, where you talk, whether you talk about our educational system, and when you, when you, continue to go upstream and um, look at and sometimes um, how how and how our um, systems operate and looking and also looking at who's at the helm of these institutions and just who's making the decisions when you look at our judicial system again when you look at our educational system like to me, I really want to just take this data and say, okay, so whether I'm going to the judicial system, whether I'm going to the courts and I'm looking, talking to the prosecutors, whether I'm talking to the judges and showing this data, whether I'm going to, to Spectrum Lakeland Health and you talking to the CEO or the, and all those different, just different sectors, right? How can you deny like you, what's happening? You don't even have to have the answers, but these things are that's happening um the disparities that family families are experiencing all moms black white green purple however you identify should be able to have a healthy birthing experience but when you look at the data you look at these institutions and you see a lot of times who's leading uh, these institutions when you look at our 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 uh, government systems when you look at the politicians when you look at all of that i mean that I know, I believe everyone on this, in this meeting, if was, if was tasked with the responsibility of, hey, write down what you think is happening. I bet, and, and we're diverse with everyone in this meeting. I bet everyone really, even though you're working with the home visiting programs, really knows what's happening and why. The issue is how do we address that? And so to me, it, it is so time for us to, to try to figure out, you know, what needs to happen. And so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm off my soapbox. That just, uh, that's my spiel. I'm done talking. I'm, yeah, so thank you. No need to apologize, Kina. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing, for sharing your thoughts. I see a couple of hands up. Um, the first thing I think, is it, is it Sokna? Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. I love this conversation. It's so important. And I put in the chat um, some events that we had a couple of weeks ago for Black Breastfeeding Week here in Kalamazoo. I'm the co-chair for the Kalamazoo Breastfeeding Coalition with Katie Pearson, who's the lead lactation consultant at WIC. And it was beautiful. And my whole thing with my 
support for women. I'm a lactation consultant at Bronson. I have Mama Sutra, Loving Arts in the Community. I've been a doula for 19 years. My whole focus is I attend these meetings. I know what's going on. I see it firsthand. And we are here to support, but also uplifting and showing the successes and the beauty of us recognizing who we are in the community, seeing people. So we had this exhibit, um, a photo exhibit at the Black Arts and Cultural Center for a week. It was gorgeous. I don't know if any of you saw it, but it was all of our, um, many, not all of our, but many of our mamas who came through the, um, hi Kenna, <laughs> um, who came through our doula, W Med doula program who were breastfeeding their babies, their photographs breastfeeding their babies. It was gorgeous, y'all, beautiful. And then we hosted a, and they came and they were so happy to see themselves exhibited in a photo exhibit. We had wine, we had cheese, we had all the things. And then on that Friday night, we had a panel of Bianca, Rakisha, me and Evelyn Williams. So we wanted to be, here are four people from four different organizations in this area who support breastfeeding. Do you know that a woman came in off the street, a 16 year old mama whose baby was born 31 weeks and she sat, she came to the photo exhibit and she came to the panel and she is still nursing her baby. I want to tell you, and this week her baby is 34 weeks old. And I just wanna uplift um, the successes. We need to also talk about the successes. Yes, this is, these things are definitely happening. The atrocities, they are atrocities. Um, the trauma that is, has been diagnosed that we know stays in our bodies is deep in a black woman's body, is deep in a Na Native American woman's body, is deep in the brown body. And it's also deep in the white body because it is the cause and effect, right? So we have to look at this. If we're gonna look, why is that baby in the, in the river? Y'all, there's so many reasons why that baby's in the river. And I have been, um, Katie and I are actually right now writing a curriculum for education on breast anatomy and women's anatomy because our anatomy brings forth babies and it needs to be taught point by point at levels of understanding starting in fourth, fifth grade, when babies start adult, when our breasts start developing, when our bodies start changing. You know, reproductive health in Kalamazoo school system is not a great program. I'm just gonna put it out there. My kids are in this program and thank God they're my children because we talk about the real stuff at home and we need to be talking about the real stuff at home. And um, this is pure physiology, what we're talking about. Your body is going to now make a baby. This is how your body functions. This is how your breast changes. These, these are your hormones. This is how you take care of yourself. It is not when we get pregnant, it's too late. I work with 40 year old women, 37 year old women, a 42 year old woman giving birth, they don't know their own bodies. So how could a nine, 10 year old, 12 year old child and what is their environment at home? These are the things that we need to be talking about. And I was in a meeting this morning. I know there are a lot, there are many lactation consultants. There are people who have taken the trainings here in Kalamazoo, but they're not serving. I really want to lift up everyone who's taken their trainings, put your training, your certification to work, embody it, meet with people, follow us, um, come to our classes, invite us to come and teach the staff to review what you learned so that we can really promote it and educate our families. We, when people are coming into um, the perinatal appointments, that's prenatal, labor, and postpartum, they don't seem to be understanding what they're doing, how it's important, how it's alive in their bodies. So I just wanted to say that. I, yes, there are lots of gaps, but I think that we all have, uh, we need to embody what we're doing so that we feel more powerful and how to apply it and how we can feel um, better and stronger and more confident in protecting our mama's babies and birthing people in our community. Thank you for my long wing. I really long wanted to say that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Maureen, are, are you um, trying to say something? I see you unmuting. Nope. Okay. All right. Kelly, you have your hand up. Yeah. Hi, this is Kelly Britton. I'm a senior program officer at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan Foundation. And actually the foundation as well as Blue Cross is interested in uplifting um, what Kena was raising in terms of addressing the upstream factors 
related to not only maternal mortality, but severe maternal morbidity. And so in the um, upcoming weeks, I would encourage all of you all, and we'll send it out to Region 8 because Region 8 is one of our primary uh, priority regions for those uh, community-inspired solutions to address, again, specific for severe maternal morbidity, um, maternal mortality. I love the work that you all are working and have done in addressing infant mortality as that outcome. But as the data that shows that, you know, when you have a healthy mama, right? When you are addressing high blood pressure, food insecurity, housing insecurity, domestic violence, or any of the other recommendations that came from the Michigan Maternal Mortality Review recommendations, that is going further upstream. And so we're really interested in um, uplifting um, and supporting those efforts in Region 8. Um, and so we've selected about, we selected five priority regions based upon the data um, that was shown today. So those uh, regions that were above the Michigan level will be our considered our priority regions. And we will be contacting the regional perinatal quality improvement collaboratives directly with this uh, targeted ask, uh, targeted request for proposals um, from those perinatal, uh, perinatal quality improvement collaboratives and or organizations that make up the collaborative. So it's not solely to fund the collaborative, but if there are organizations that are really doing that upstream work or want to do the upstream work, like home visiting programs and extending that into, uh, you know, high blood pressure or other programs that are looking at um, food and nutrition insecurity, not solely specific just for the pregnant woman, but for those of reproductive age. Again, so these are the things that uh, we are uh, going to um, solicit from all of you um, in the next coming weeks. And we are expecting that um, these projects would be um, for a year, um, up to $50,000. Um, and we're going to do one per region. And so at this point, we're really trying to get targeted and get really focused. Um, and because this is a priority, we expect that um, although the first year would just be one year of funding, we are already planning for continuation funding or expansion into year two and, um, and beyond. It's really, really important uh, work that the collaboratives do. Um, and the collaboratives are only as strong as the organizations that are um, a part of them. And I'm sorry for the long windedness, but I really just wanted to uplift what Keena was saying and how um, the foundation is looking to support that work. Great, thanks so much, Kelly. That's so awesome that, um, that, that you all are doing that and we look forward to seeing more details on it. So thank you for sharing. Well, thank you, Kina, for kicking off a really good conversation and debrief about the data and thanks everybody for, for sharing your thoughts. I think um, that was a really important conversation and um, I look forward to continuing that, that conversation with all of you. Um, I'm going to um, go ahead and move on to the last part of our agenda today, um, which is where we wanted to share some information with you all about um, some of the efforts that we've been doing around um, immunizations, particularly for the COVID vaccine, as well as um, um, childhood immunizations. So let me share my screen again real quick. Um, so one of the things I, I mentioned earlier that we're doing um, an event with Cradle Kalamazoo this fall. Um, another thing um, that we've been working on is we developed some videos for promoting the COVID vaccine as well as childhood immunizations. Um, so this is um, part of the additional funding that we got from MDHHS in order to support um, COVID and childhood immunizations. Um, so we worked with a company called Effective and produced two videos that have been shared on television and streaming services throughout the region um, since early July. 
So some of you may have seen these. Um, if you, um, I think it's through Comcast, um, any of the ways that you can um, watch or stream Comcast services. So as of the end of August, so they started in early July, by the end of August, we have um, just under 250,000 impressions. Um, so those are views um, and 90% of those were viewed in full. Um, so it, they've had really good reach, which is exciting. And so we wanted to make sure that we shared those videos with you all so you can see them um, as well as uh, be on the lookout for them. So the first one is um, about um, COVID vaccines during pregnancy. And actually, I need to make sure I'm sharing sound. Let me do that. OK. I love Southwest Michigan, but I can't wait to travel again. And now that I am pregnant, my doctor assured me that the COVID-19 vaccine was safe, even if I'm pregnant and breastfeeding. So I chose to get the COVID-19 vaccine. I'm relieved that my baby and I will be protected, no matter where we go or who we visit. Talk to your healthcare provider today about getting the COVID-19 vaccine and get back to sharing, experiencing, and living life again. So that's the COVID-19 um, vaccine that's targeting particularly pregnant um, audiences. And then the next one is I love Southwest Michigan. One. Vaccinations save lives including your child. Because of advances in medical science, your child can be more protected from diseases than ever before. Vaccinations are safe and effective and help protect future generations. Vaccinations are strongly encouraged by daycare facilities and schools. Protect the ones you love by talking to your health care provider about staying up to date on vaccinations. Vaccination. All right, so those are those are our videos. Vaccination. All right, and um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Janine to close us out. And it looks like we're going to be closing out a little bit early today. Oh, you're on mute, Janine. Sorry about that. Thanks, Jen. Uh, thank you everyone for making space to be a part of our collaborative meeting this afternoon. Um, I'm sure you had the opportunity to be at other places, attending other activities, but that you chose to spend these couple of hours with the Southwest Michigan Perinatal Quality Improvement Collaborative, we're grateful. So if you could please take a moment to complete the evaluation here. This is very valuable information for us. It helps us to improve our meetings. So if you could take a, a few minutes to complete the um, survey, the evaluation, we would very much appreciate that. And certainly we are offering time, space for you to do that now. Elena also put the link in the chat. Um, if Thanks, you don't Elena. want to use the, the uh, QR code on the screen. Okay, well, feel free to um, finish up your responses to the evaluation survey as you get on your way to whatever is next in your day. And as Janine said, thanks so much for, for joining us today. Thanks so much for being a part um, of our meeting today. Um, and um, be on the lookout for dates for upcoming meetings. We'll be setting the dates for um, fiscal year 23 soon. So those should be coming out to you in the coming weeks. And I hope everybody has a really wonderful day. Thanks for coming.